Welcome back, y'all. First, I've got a question for you. How do you feel about true crime stories? Can't get enough or gives you the creeps? If there are any true crime fans out there, it's fair to say you're definitely not alone. The genre has seen a boom over the past decade, driven by the rise of true crime podcasts like Serial, My Favorite Murder, and Dirty John. It's now dominating much of our TV landscape from documentary series like Making a Murderer to scripted adaptations like The Girl from Plainville. The true crime genre is a peculiar mix of journalism, documentary, and sensational entertainment, for better or worse. So it's worth looking into what we can learn from the true crime boom. And what better way to do that than with a deep dive on Pop Quiz. Here to lead us down the rabbit hole is entertainment correspondent and ITL pal, Casey Mendoza. Casey, what's going on? doing well Christian uh, but you know first how do you feel about true crime uh, do you have a favorite Netflix series or crime podcast I got really into Atlanta monster uh, I got really into um, parody shows like uh, only murders in the building today we're putting the true crime craze under the microscope to see what it says about us and how we think about crime entertainment and justice we're tackling the question what can we learn from true crime? And that answer is gonna take us from the world of social psychology to forensics labs to messy Netflix lawsuits. Are you ready? I'm putting on my fedora, my trench coat, and my magnifying glass. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's go. Christian, you mentioned how true crime has really blossomed over the past few years. And interestingly, Research has shown women in particular have been drawn to the genre, which at first might seem surprising. A lot of these stories focus on female victims, some of them very gruesome. So what's the big appeal? Women want to read about what was in the killer's background that caused him to kill or what set him off. What red flag should I look for? They also like to read about stories where the, the woman used some sort of escape trick to, to make it out alive. And when I sat back and kind of looked at these together, I thought, well, all of these are clearly related to survival, right? Amanda also noted that while true crime can be helpful in some ways, it can be misleading in others. I think what's happening is that the, the media and the podcasts and the true crime shows are focusing on the rare or unusual crimes, right? And these sort of crimes, someone being kidnapped off the street or someone has broken into your house and that, these are more likely to happen to women. So men are actually more likely to be killed in, in some sort of violence. But that's often things like shooting or gang violence or something like that. Those don't get covered in a podcast that much. Despite the genre's focus on female victims, the UN reports that 81% of homicides recorded globally are men. Women are also far more likely to be killed by a partner or family member than a stranger. Or, you know, another example, the rates of children being kidnapped are incredibly low in the U.S., less than 350 a year on average. Uh, Christian, be honest, have you ever watched a scary movie or true crime doc and got spooked it might happen to you too? I gotta be honest, not really. I grew up black in America, so I don't think there are too many things that rattle me too often, to be honest. That's very fair. You know, again, a lot of true crime <laughs> is centered on female victims, and specifically white female victims. So. so this somewhat skewed understanding of crime goes beyond what women may be taking away from these stories. It can impact real court cases and jury selection. There is also the infamous CSI effect, which refers to the idea that jurors may be expecting more evidence like they see on TV. While experts disagree on how tangible the CSI effect is, the myth is enough to have an impact. For example, it seems to drive some investigators to do extra tests, like collecting extra DNA or samples, even if they don't actually contribute to the case. The idea is that they know the jury is expecting impressive forensic evidence. So quite a bit of money is wasted to give the appearance of forensic evidence. And the impact doesn't stop there. True crime has also had a huge effect on the investigation outcome. The podcast Serial, 
brought international attention to the murder conviction of Adnan Syed, and an HBO series followed years later. Some evidence from the podcast even made its way to trial, and later, the showrunner on the series even uncovered new evidence while investigating the case. There is another side to this, though. Oftentimes, we forget these are real people, who are the victims, culprits, and suspects. And the attention they get from true crime stories can be severely damaging. The family of the victim in Syed's case, Heyman Lee, stated the podcast reopened wounds, and it remains hard to see so many run to defend someone who committed a horrible crime. In another infamous example, Netflix's hit series Making a Murderer ran into hot water after clearly portraying police officer Andrew Colburn as corrupt. He would later sue Netflix for defamation after he claimed fans of the show harassed him and his family so much they built a safety bunker at their home. A number of people in the town have also complained about how the series has impacted them. I have heard of cases where random people on the internet have helped identify, um, you know, a John Doe or Jane Doe body that has been recovered, that they've been able to put the pieces together and link it to a missing person. There have definitely been cases of that. Uh, I've also heard cases of people who the internet has decided is a suspect in a case and that person being harassed by random people at the internet, calling them on their phone or, you know, driving by their house or something like that. So we've talked about the things we learn about survival, about ourselves, and about how we think about crime. But if we take a step back, the rise of true crime can also tell us something about our current cultural moment. The genre was dominated in the 80s and 90s by glitzy and sensational cases like the John Benet Ramsey case or by celebrities like O.J. Simpson. Today, many of these true crime stories focus on ways the justice system has failed marginalized people or groups. It seems like in a lot of the fictional shows, they're the good guys, right? The police and the detectives are the good guys. The prosecutors are the good guys. They're putting the people away. They almost always get it right. And I've seen a shift um, in podcasts and that and shows recently to this area of wrongful convictions. I think people are really into that. Um, it really strikes, I think, kind of a social justice nerve in people, along with the unsolved mystery element of it. All of this goes to show that as much as true crime influences our own perceptions, crime and safety, true crime is equally shaped by us. But now I want to turn the spotlight back to you, Christian, and see what you've been able to learn from true crime. I'm going to quiz you on some common myths and tips that pop up in true crime all the time, and you're gonna have to do your best to survive this quiz. I am not really prepared for this. I mean, much like when I was an actual student, I didn't do any studying, so, you know, let's wing it. Well, this is about survival, so let's hope you, you know, at least show that you can be a safe person. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the first one. This technique for safety is a popular theory among women and is sometimes called the Wolverine. What is it? I'm guessing this is when you take uh, individual keys and place them like between your fingers and kind of use that as a way to, you know, to, to get an assailant back. Is that, is that what that is? That is correct. Uh, that is, uh, you know, the nickname the Wolverine, putting your keys between your fingers, uh, which experts say that's not actually a good idea. Uh, you would probably just damage your hand. If they're that close at that point, you probably have easier ways to do some damage. Say you're walking home alone at night. It's very dark and you can't see your surroundings well. What would you do to feel more safe or, you know, discourage any potential attackers? One of the things that I have done in the past is making it almost seem as though I'm not the person to, you know, to try and attack, right? Maybe I'm like, you know, maybe I'm, I'm walking real fast or I'm acting like a little erratic. There's a there's a TikTok trend where it's like, never let them know your next step, right? That is, you know, pretty close to the safety tip. Uh, you know, safety experts say, do not use earbuds or look at your phone because you might just end up looking distracted and more like a victim. They do, you know, they do say, do walk confidently. You want to seem like you're going to be more of a problem. 
so yay good i'm a problem all right i'm a problem <laughs> i'm a problem for my parents i'm a problem for my wife i'm a problem for my co-workers i mean i feel like i've got that down already so so you could there be you a go. problem for a potential attacker very good That's it. <laughs> you called up an uber a car drives up and the driver calls out uber what do you do um, I've gotten in the habit of ensuring that the person who is um, the person who's coming to pick me up, I'll I'll check their license plate because it's just it's easy it's easy to get you know get cars mixed up, kind of open the door and start to get in the car. I'll kind of check with them, make sure they look like the person in the picture. I'll I'll say like, who are you here for? And they'll say, you know, Christian. I'm like, okay, cool. You are absolutely correct and safe in this situation. Uh, experts say to check plates and ask, who are you picking up to see if they know your first name? Uh, don't call out your name for them, which very sad fact about myself. I was one of the people who would say Uber for Casey, and that's not safe, don't do that. Last one, say you're out with the ITL team for dinner and you take a couple photos on your phone to post online. How do you do it safely? I, I'm not sure I know how I would do this safely. I mean, how, how unsafe am I being? So it's not about, you know, how you take a photo. It's about when you post them. So the safety tip is, you know, oh, okay. wait till you get home to post them so you're not posting your location in real time. Uh, basically make it so that stalkers can't find you if you have them. That's uh, that makes that makes absolutely perfect sense. I, I don't know if uh, you know there are too many crazed fans of ITL out there. It really really watching my every move, and I'm an infrequent poster too. Uh, I usually like to take a bit of time to think of a, a witty caption, but this all of this makes perfect sense, Casey. I you know I always look forward to these moments where I get a chance to talk to you and learn a little something about. Um, you know, about pop culture and how it affects the, the world that we live in. Casey Mendoza, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Of course, we should say that it's never anyone's fault for getting into danger. Just wanted to make that very clear. But it's always good to know some helpful tips in case something happens.